Okay, so let's look briefly at the original publication of Spallard and Olmars. Um, and uh, this was a publication based on their conference paper, which you can pull from AIAA today, and there's the AIAA um, citation. So they took their conference paper, they took the feedback from the community and published it in a peer review publication. And what I love uh, to see here is they submitted on March 27th, 1992, and it was accepted May of 1993. So it took about a little over a year to get reviews back and criticism and fix up their paper. So when you submit your own articles and it takes over a year for review and publication, don't feel too bad because maybe your work will be as impactful as a turbulence model that's in like every CFD code today. <laughs> so I often think about these things when I look at good papers. Anyway, this is a French journal, so they have a um, little introduction in French, but uh, the language, the, the articles were written in English um, for our benefit. And just going through it, I love it uh, when people tell me what's going on right away. And here's their major contribution in the first sentence. And I um, appreciate that. And they made a few strong <coughs> statements in their abstract. They said that it's a compatible with grids of any structured because a lot of these models had to run on structured grids. It's numerically forgiving, meaning that you can have uh, maybe not so wonderful grids and still get convergence. And you can probably, uh, um, you know, kind of, I'm not sure what the point is there um, besides that. Um, they have well-defined boundary conditions. They're easy to implement, which is nice than maybe other models. And it's been calibrated for a wide range of flows and shows good predictions. And most importantly, it's been implemented already by eight separate groups. And in the NASA Turbulence Modeling Resource website, they actually rank models by how many uh, different groups have actually implemented it. So models which are more well received are already running in different codes. They use different numerics, different solvers, and they're robust in finding similar results. So that's important. But uh, we already talked to model a lot. Um, I'd like to point out a few interesting things in the paper. They claim here, this is nomenclature list if you wanted to see it, um, but they say that their model is, uh, you know, local. Um, and uh, so that's a benefit beyond other models. And uh, they give some criticisms of K epsilon models um, and uh, other types of models. And uh, they're big proponents of one equation model. So this little part is like criticism and what they believe as part of how they progressed their model in the field. Um, they really were inspired by Baldwin and Barth's work and others, which they note there. And uh, a lot of this um, was actually done in collaborative testing with the uh, testing turbulence modeling group um, under Bradshaw. And uh, they, they note this new Kovasny model. Uh, Kovasny was a famous turbulence researcher, um, maybe not so much in turbulence modeling, but that was the outcome of their work. So that's all referenced. And I think it, if you want to kind of like see how two really smart people think, I think it's worth kind of scanning down the introduction of this article. I also think it's well written and a highly cited article. So I think those are nice things you can learn from reviewing it. Um, one thing I like that they also noted in the introduction, which I wanted to highlight here, is that a lot of groups try and create like universal models that we can create a turbulence model or closure that works for like all flows, you know, low speed through hypersonic just perfectly. And nobody's ever done that. So a lot of people have focused on universal models or trying to find one. It's like looking for the holy grail. But here they try to focus on a subset of practical flows for, um, like Boeing, and uh, I think that's worked well for them versus trying to go for something more. Um, just going down the paper here, the things I wanted to notice. I noticed this little sentence here. Um, all this. You'll notice that in the DC Wilcox work I just mentioned that um, 
they chose for the initial model that S should go as omega, but you can um, generalize that a bit more and look for um, like a strain rate tensor in full 3D. And so in the practice of this model, this is really omega. Uh, going down, they actually present their model again, just like their conference paper is like four parts. This is on calibration. Uh, this is for calibration of their flows. And then they talk some about transition in here, which you're welcome to look at. Near wall regions, near wall calibration. So this goes through in detail of everything I just talked about. You can see, see a lot of the same functions. And I'm looking for just a few of their validation results. So this equation should look familiar to you, all right? And this is the turbulent transition, trip terms, and this is a transition prediction calibration and validation, figure seven. But I just wanted to look at the few of the most basic predictions for the good of the class, which is down in the results section here. And one of the hardest flows that they wanted to look at uh, for boundary layers was called the Samuel um, Jobert flow. Right there. So what is that? That's nothing but an adverse pressure gradient flow, and the pressure gradient is gradually increasing. So a lot of the wind tunnel experiments, sometimes you just have a constant increasing uh, pressure gradient, like partial P, partial X is like a constant, positive constant. Here, this gradually increased, and it's a little bit more challenging. So they chose one of the more challenging flows um, for their uh, model to be calibrated against. And giving you an idea, the Reynolds number, about 10 to the fourth, and they have uh, all the statistics here. But let's just look at some results. Um, here's momentum and displacement thickness in the particular flow. Um, X-axis, this is the direction of the flow, and then this is uh, their flow quantities, models and experiments. Experiments are dots for two flows. Pretty good agreement. Um, Here's a velocity profile, so you can see there's some disagreement here. But once again, this flow is not calibrated against directly, and um, it's a true prediction. Let's look at some more interesting flows. Um, they list grid point density, so you can get an idea here. Grid points are on, on the order of 400 by 80, or 800 by 160. There's two grids, so that looks like a grid independent study. and. Um, they were looking at more difficult flows now, like higher Mach numbers and Reynolds numbers, coefficient of lift. So it's about subsonic Mach 0.725, Reynolds number 6.5 times 10 to the 6. And uh, they pulled a lot of these flows for comparison from a workshop, this is transonic airfoil workshop. So let's look at one as an example where they compare their model to previous well-established models. So this is X over C, this is the airfoil. And this is the pressure side, and this is the suction side. Here's coefficient of pressure. Always plot negative CP on the positive y-axis. Why? Because that way you have, like, the upper line will be the upper surface of your airflow, right? So that's why it's reversed, very traditional. So here's the zero axis. So on the pressure line, you have um, fully attached flow, uh, and a good agreement between all three models, or excuse, yeah, three models, Baldwin Lomax, which is the one we're going to program in Project 4, which I'll talk about Thursday, Johnson King, and uh, of course, SA model, and experiments are dots. So here's the suction side. You can see the flow comes up. There's probably some transition region here, and uh, this is the shock. And it looks like all the models do pretty well. And it's very hard to measure shock position. So that just gives you an idea. Here's a real world, more real world air foil case that does well. That's a RAE air foil. Here's another example, skin friction. No measurements. Here's one more prediction. Case 10, so same air foil, different uh, condition. So this one uh, is a little bit harder for the previous models, and here's the experiments. This is the shock. SA model does a better job of predicting shock location 
and by about 0.05 um, cord lengths. A better transition location also. All the models do really well, except near the trailing edge. Um, but I think like, you know, you start to kind of like push these models outside their calibrated envelope, especially from algebraic models, you're getting better predictions. Just scroll down. Um, with increasing computer power, people could start resolving trailing edges. And I think this is probably one reason the article uh, had more time in the review process because it's uh, technically these airfoil coordinates are defined all the way to X over C of one meaning the tip of the airfoil, but when you manufacture them, you wouldn't necessarily have a sharp edge airfoil because uh, multiple reasons. One is safety, and you know, so manufacturing like a sh truly sharp pointed edge just isn't possible. But also you wouldn't want your technicians to cut their hands, so they often truncated the airfoil just like this. See, that's the airfoil trailing edge of the airfoil. And that means they had grids here, right? So they have totally resolved the flow, and they found this like maybe oscillating, recirculating region, and uh, the flow is stable, and I think it caused a lot of confusion for the experimentalists. In fact, they talk about this blunt trailing edge computation right there in the paper. And they even, in their paper, which impressed me, mentioned that um, the reviewers uh, gave comments on the paper and went back in the paper, and they were thinking and, and referencing the reviewers' comments within their own paper. I don't see that very often, but I found it to be pretty um, polite. So that's a little tip for the future too. Anyway, um, summary and results of this particular article uh, right here. Let's just circle this little part here. I think this was interesting. They said, in a few cases with shock-induced separation, the new model yielded a limit cycle with a pulsation of the bubble when the algebraic models yielded steady solutions. Since time accurate solutions are expensive, steady solutions may be greeted as a success whether they are physically correct or not. I'll let you interpret that how you want. Down here is another key sentence that I enjoyed. It said, overall the model appears robust enough to be implemented by independent users in a variety of codes and physical situations and it should be particularly attractive to unstructured grids. That was a huge and important statement that a lot of the turbulence model development, the equations become so complicated at the end that they're very difficult to code. Uh, maybe you felt that way, some of you working with me over the years, but um, I think that's appreciated by the community. And I noticed some AIAA awards and others being given to people because their models were simple and applicable to just general uh, engineers for their analysis, which I think is good. Anyway, um, down here they have the summary of the model. And this is a little bit different than the summary of DC Wilcox, but you can see it follows their original model development. So this is after the fourth part with the transition, as you can see there's the FT coefficients. If you didn't want the FT model, you can just set FT2 to zero and get rid of this last term. And then you'll have like the first part three base model, which we showed in the, in the lecture we just gave. Okay, with that, I think we'll maybe spend some time just open question discussion about the, uh, the third term project.